listeners, and welcome to Pop Screen, part of Geek Show Podcast Network. We are the Geek Show's podcast dedicated to the good, the bad, and the bewildering of movies either starring by or about pop stars. I know the podcast covers such a broad range of musical and cinematic genres, from documentaries to science fiction, from country and western to hip-hop. I'm your host, Graham Williamson. I'm a film critic for The Geek Show and Horrified.com, the British horror website. I also make films and write inlay booklets for Second Run DVD. I am joined this week by... In Vakin, uh, once again, uh, I also contribute to the Geek Show, and you can find me under Letterbox under the username Aiden F. Now, there are many films over the years, from La Ventura to Southland Tales, that have got a stinky reception at the Cannes Film Festival, but only one of them, so far as we know, caused no lesser personage than Steven Spielberg to mouth what the fuck was that when the film <laughs> ended? That honour belongs to a very singular film, Pink Floyd's The Wall, co-directed by Alan Parker, who handled the live-action segments, and Gerard Scarf, the legendary caricaturist who did the animated scenes. The real authorial voice, of course, is none other than Roger Waters, mainstay of Pink Floyd from their origins to the present day, who made the concept album The Wall about his childhood trauma following the aftermath of World War II and his increasing alienation from everyday life life caused by being a big rock megastar what has parties and that it's (laughs) it's a film that is well worthy of spielberg's response and yet it has had a consistent cult following since its release buoyed in part by the continued relevance and popularity of pink floyd but also in its genuine uniqueness as a film now Pink Floyd's The Wall. This was one you requested, wasn't it, Aidan? This is one you said we should cover. Yeah, because, and I think it just goes back down to, um, again, Pink Floyd as a band, um, because, you know, we've we've got to do at least one progressive rock band or psychedelic rock band eventually for this podcast. So it's, and and I think this is like the, what, what, what the only, one of the only films that's probably worth talking about, really, a little over it. Yeah, it's weird because considering that progressive rock was noted for big theatrical concepts, it does not have much of a cinematic footprint. Hmm, yeah, so it's probably worth doing it for that matter. So, I would say so, yeah. 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 And Pink Floyd were always kind of like soft prog, weren't they? They weren't prog in the way that King Crimson were. Or, say, like, yes, where, or. Or gentle giant or, or things like that but yeah i think the, the psychedelic rock roots overshadowed them more than the progressive rock roots for me so some of their songs what, what i mean when i say soft prog is that some of their songs are less than 20 minutes long and have a discernible tune <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um I, I should probably explain a bit of my history with pink floyd um because when I was young and I was getting seriously into music and I decided to start listening to music from before my, you know, birth that wasn't just stuff that my parents liked. Although the stuff that my parents liked was mostly good, I must say. I had a good grounding that way. But when I decided to explore for myself, the first thing I latched onto was punk. So... Mm -hmm. This has always made prog rock a bit difficult for me because, of course, w- when you're young, you want to be part of your favourite band seen in a very tribal way. And I mm-hmm. wanted to be punk in a very tribal way. And part of that meant hating prog rock because that's what punk was in, in a lot of ways a reaction against. There's the famous story that Malcolm McLaren, the manager of the Sex Pistols, worked out that John Lydon would be a great frontman for his band when he saw him walking around in a Pink Floyd t-shirt, but he'd written, I hate above the band's (laughs) name. Um, So it's it's always been, even though I can appreciate the Pink Floyd and not the kind of prog rock that makes me hate prog rock. They're not Emerson, Lake and Palmer. I I get that. Um, But uh, it, it is still something that I have a hard time appreciating, and it, a lot of it has that kind of why associate with like a seventies, eighties stadium rock sound, where 
you know, there is no such thing as too much chorus or too much phasing on your guitar. And it's, mm. although it's not a sound that I hate, although I have moved a long way past that tribal identification with punk, uh, it's, it's a sound that I, I still struggle with a bit, I think. No, I, I'm probably from a similar wavelength as you. I think, because I'm not a fan of prog rock at all, and again, it goes back to the ideas of like, once you latch onto like obscure themes of fantasy and like science fiction, and then combine them in this music style that, you know, resembles more, takes influence from like, say, classical music as well. I think it's just a sound that I find sometimes a bit pompous for its own good. Yeah, yeah. Really for my like, and it's, it's always been, and I've always been like that. The only two prog rock bands that I, I could ever say that I like or that I love is one Rush. Mm. And the reason why I say Rush is because, firstly, their prog rock leanings resembles music for my liking. <laughs> <laughs> Even for how complex and neutral it is, you can definitely tell that band has talent. And I will fight you to the bitter end if you say it. Otherwise, I love Rush, honestly. Um, and the other is Pink Floyd. Yeah. The reason why I kind of like Pink Floyd is again they don't again it goes back to that soft prog idea that you explained earlier they don't really talk about like the stereotypical ideas that surrounds prog rock like say science fiction classical music mm. uh, fantasy etc again they take more stamp of psychedelic rock they take more influences from that stance and I like that a bit more again I wouldn't call myself 100% a fan but I, I'm you know I, I I would say that I enjoy, like, say, stuff like The Wall or Dark Side of the Moon. Or Wish You Were Here, Wish You Were Here, for example. Wish um, You Were Here, I must say, is the one that even I have trouble resisting the charms of. I do think that's a good album. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it, it's strange because I think if I was getting into music now, if I had the same taste that I did back then now, I would probably be a lot better uh, disposed towards Pink Floyd because they, even back in the late 90s people would be surprised I didn't like Pink Floyd because they would say oh you're, you're a big Radiohead fan, you're a big Spiritualized fan and both of those bands mm. sound like Pink Floyd and it's like yeah I can see it but I, I don't know uh, in another way I can't I, I can't really see that because when you think of Radiohead I mean and again I love Radiohead but the, the idea behind Radiohead is that they have like a bit more of a complex personality as well. A bit I think when, when you think of Radiohead now, it's very hard to like find the Pink Floyd influence in something like The King of Limbs, certainly. But well, oh, 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 kid here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But when you listen back to, I mean, maybe the last two songs on OK Computer, Lucky and The Tourist, I will concede that they do sound pretty Pink Floyd y. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to say this right now. My favorite Radiohead album is Kid A. I love Kid A. Kid A is gorgeous, yeah. And I felt yeah. very old in 2018 when I realised that it was now legally adult A. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yes, but back to Pink Floyd. I, I suppose what I'm constructing a launch pad for here is that I was quite surprised that although I didn't love this film, I actually found it much easier to get on with than I expected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think part of it was that part of what the the antipathy towards prog rock was about, particularly from that punk perspective, was a kind of reverse snobbery where it's like, oh, it's public school boys talking about how you know awful it is to have a lot of money. And the wall was often held up about that. People say, oh, it's, it's an album about how terrible it is to be a rich rock star with loads of groupies around you. And when you watch the film, you think, well... I can see a bit of where that came from, and I think that is a bit in there, but in the context of the whole film, that really isn't it, I don't think. Yeah, I, I find that a hard thing to clarify as true, because I, I don't feel that as, at all, because mm. this is basically, this is the era of, like, Roger Waters' career, and I, I will admit, I do like, I think I'm more Roger Waters fan than I am a Pink Floyd fan. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I just find them, like, there's this earnestness to him that I actually quite admire. Even mm. when you see him like in interviews, like talking about how dark his past was, you know, growing up in like the 1950s, 60s, you know, school system where yeah. it was like basically like like a factory and how 
traumatic that was, and especially losing his father, like, very, very young age. Like, I believe, like, he was, like, only two when his father died in, like, World War II or something like that. God, yeah. Which is, like, I, I find that, like, a, a very admirable man, to be honest. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, and no, one, no one's going to change my mind about that, even though, yeah, okay, he can be seen as, like, some people have called him a tyrant, or some people have called him, like, you know, hard to get along with him, like, Dave, him or David Gilmore, or uh, Nick Mason, or things like, people like that. But I, I actually quite admire the guy, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, yeah. And I think what one of the sort of good things about the wall is, ironically, the thing that makes it so easy to attack, which is that it's such a... <laughs> It's such a good concept album. It's such a cohesive concept album that when you take a song out of that context, it becomes easy to misinterpret. Another Brick in the Wall part two is is a song where, which, when you hear it out of context, is very easy to write off. Like, oh, it's a public school boy moaning about how tough school was. But the purpose of the wall as an album and a film is mm. to give you this complete overview of society. You have the war, you have people who come home from the war and are traumatised, you have people mm-hmm. who then become school teachers, as many military men of that generation did, and they take their traumas out on the children who grow up to be traumatised as well. And it's like, it, it's, it, it's a work that gains strength from the environment of a concept album, I think. Mm. And for as twisted as this film is, you've got to admire like the imagery on display here, especially Jared Scarf's like animation. I mean, yeah, it's it's stunning in places. It's like incredibly potent, incredibly powerful. I mean, I think the segment, I think the the image that really struck me is when you see the, I think it's like during the war segment of like King's childhood uh, memory of like the war, and you just see like the image of the Union Jack, mm. and it shatters. And then it turns into this crucifix that's bleeding, like soaked in blood, in blood, yes. basically, yeah. like dripping down into the gutter below. That's incredibly, when you see imagery like that, it's incredibly inventive and creative on that front alone. Because it, it's just telling, you can get a hundred different meanings of it. Like from either like saying like the blood of the land is like, you know, people would rather die for their country and the amount of spilled blood that comes with it as well. And of different meanings, I find. Yeah. Going into it, Scarf was the part of it that I was like least troubled about because I've always loved Gerard Scarf. I've always admired him for his work along uh, magazines like uh, he was involved in Private Eye back in the 60s when it started. And some of the imagery in here, particularly towards the end of the kind of grotesque judges, do resemble the stuff that he was doing for Private Eye. Mm. I do not know whose decision it was to bring it him in, but it was a masterstroke. It really lifts the film into something truly special. Mm, definitely. I, I completely agree. I mean, no matter how many things you can definitely sell that the extensions of the characters found in this film is definitely relates to like Parker sequences as well. Yeah. I think it's a great combination of talent there. And Parker is, is a guy I've often struggled to get along with as well. I think he was one of that generation of British directors who whose main ambition seemed to be to go off to America, which I, I don't object to, mm. you know, on principle. Mm. I'm a big Christopher Nolan fan, so I'd be a hypocrite if I did. But he also got quite a lot of control over the way the British film industry was run around the turn of the millennium. And his attitude seemed to be that the British film industry should be there in large part to help out Hollywood. And that's why you've mm. got all of these ridiculous responses from the UK Film Council, which you know, <laughs> one decision of David Cameron's that I didn't hate him for was dissolving the UK Film Council, where it was like, it, this was the biggest year for British film ever. And the report would be like... You know, a Star Wars film and a Batman film and something like that. And, oh, they, they film bits at Elstree, you see, so they're British films now, and that was very much Parker's doing. Um, yeah, yeah, and and same generation as Ridley Scott as well, wasn't he? Yeah, as yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've got to admit, I really like Anne Parker. I, I think the, of the films that I've seen, I mean, I've seen three previously, 
uh, Angel Heart, Birdie, and what was the other one? Midnight Express. Oh all, yeah, all which, yeah. Are, all which are films that I really like actually because you know I think I'm not too swayed on Ridley Scott with Parker. I, I just think that there's just a gracefulness to his filmmaking that I much appreciate more, even if you know it can get into like incredibly more darker territory. I do really like the guy as well. I think he does a good job here. I think for all the 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 work that he does is very glossy and it has to be glossy really to fit in with the sort of outrageous stylization of what Gerard Scarf is doing. But it, it just reminds me of how unfair it was when people saw that style. When the French saw that style, they said, ah, it's cinema du look, you know, the early mm. Laos Carax films and Jean-Jacques Benier and things like that. They mm. made a movement out of it, but English language critics in Britain and America always said, oh, it's like watching an advert. And it's like, well, you know, in his later years, Stanley Kubrick would watch adverts obsessively and say, look, they can tell a story in 30 seconds. I don't, like, you know, yeah. it's... Is it that bad that something looks glossy? I don't think so, no, because at the same time you had Ridley Scott making um, what the Apple advert. Yeah, Was it yeah. The Apple advert? yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's just like, look, I, I get like you, you think that way, but at the same time, they're damn well good directed at the same time. Like, they can be art as well, just as it's much as the... like, say, video games can be art or yeah, say, it's pop that... music. It's that very kind of, in America, it's something different. In America, I think it is kind of a political stance and it's a mistrust of commercialization, which I can kind of respect. But in Britain, it always struck me as being that very British criticism attitude where the highest goal of any art is to replicate reality. So the ha- the best film will be the one that most looks like the real world. And you think, okay, but let's say that my house has windows Mm-hmm. You know, what does this film give me that looking out of a window would not? <laughs> yes. Oh. But I think that what, one of the things that really surprised me going into it is that that handed down interpretation of what the wall, the actual wall in the wall is, mm. was was not true. That the wall is not a metaphor for how difficult it is to be a rock star. The wall is trauma. Mm -hmm. It's self-isolation. It's trauma. It's again, it goes back to you can get a hundred different readings of it. And you know, you can, you know, and no matter how loose it is, there's a story to it that works for the imagery that it displays. I mean, I don't think you can argue against that in that case. I think that reaction when people sort of looked at this film and said, oh, it's it's about, you know, how hard it is to be a rock star, that reaction has dated a lot worse than anything in this film. Mm, yeah, yeah, completely agree. Yeah. So this isn't just a Pink Floyd film, of course. This has Bob Geldof as Pink, the rock star mm. who the film centres on. And it's a... I think the performance works for the film, and yet by the time the film was finished, I felt like I had no idea if Bob Geldof was good at acting or not. <laughs> you know what? I think I completely agree. I'm very unsure about his performance. I, and I'm not a Bob Geldof fan. I mean, mm. I've never really cared for the Boomtown Rats or anyone like that. Um, and that's just personally my taste, really. I've nothing against the guy. It's just how I feel. Yeah. Never really cared. Um, but with this, it's an odd casting decision because you can tell that they wanted like a rock star in the role. Yeah. Which is understandable because Pink's a rock star, you know, that's how the whole setup is built around, at least. Yeah. Um, but with Geldof, I don't know. It's, it's very strange because, you know, you can tell that he's you know, trying with the material where he has, like, the zoned out moments in, like, the motel room or anything like that. And that requires, like, very minimal acting when it requires it. You know, it's not like, he's not going to delve into, like, Shakespearean monologue or anything like that. (laughs) No, no. You're not going to expect that at all. But then when you get to the sequences where he's playing, like, the fascist alter ego of Pink, Mm. with, like, the swastikas and the hammers where he's just, like, screaming at the top of his lungs and things like that, I find that more effective, in a yeah. way. 
and I, I think that's how it works. But at the same time, you know, this is like the person who, let's be honest, his acting is not at his forefront. But at the same time, it sort of works. It's very strange. It's, it's a very strange mix, I find. It's quite an odd decision to say, oh, we need a rock star for this part, because I don't think I've ever seen the film about a rock star where they do less rock star stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just like, if anything, this is like anti-rock star stuff. Completely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the time he actually gets on stage and starts performing, as you say, we're into the segment of it where he's become a dictator, a despot. So he's not going to just sort of pick up a guitar and go, oh, well, after that uh, nice, refreshing Nuremberg rally, here's one of my <laughs> early numbers. It's It's gone in another direction. I really liked the fascist stuff, by the way. I thought that was really strong and interesting. Completely agree where he's, like, screaming into the um, microphone. You know. And the other thing, too, is that it makes the aspects of it that people objected to, it makes that rock star self-pity more kind of understandable and it bends it more towards the point it's not saying feel sorry for me i'm a millionaire it's saying mm. being in this isolated life you know being in a life where you are led to believe that you are more special and more important than the unwashed masses mm. will breed this horrible attitude in you will make you kind of like the fascism that took roger waters's father's life Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think that's the only interpretation of it. As you say, it's, it's a very interpretable film, but I think structurally, the fact that it begins and ends with fascism has to mean something. Yeah, it's, it's got to. And you can definitely tell that, again, through Scarf's animation. I mean, you get the whole segment with the trial as well. Yeah. Like, for example, with um, how like these characters that you've seen early in the film, whether that be like the school education system, the teachers, um, Pink's uh, missus, his mother, and they in that final segment where they just transform into these manifestations of what their beliefs are and the ideas are, mm -hmm. you know, it can be completely grueling. But again, it's like incredibly inventive on that front because it just, it screams yeah. like, you know, it demands your attention no matter how loose or interpretable the imagery can be. Yeah, completely. And uh, a, a lot of that, as we've said, is Scarf. He ports over that attitude from his political cartooning that the best way to get an idea across is to combine two images. And there is a lot of that in here. Like you say, the Union Jack turning into the, the bloodied cross is the sort of thing where you think that's great and I'm grateful nobody had to try and express that idea in dialogue, you know? Yeah, I know, yeah, which you could see that countless examples of that and you just want to cringe whenever they do that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But the other aspect of it that we haven't really talked about is the actual album, the music, right? Um, mm, yeah. Now, I'm going to say this right now because I'm, again, I'm, I like Pink Floyd, but like I said I, beforehand, I, I would consider myself more Roger Waters fan than I am a Pink Floyd fan. Um, but I would say, and it's not unpopular, The Wall is probably my favourite of their albums. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's got, like I say, coming into this as a Pink Floyd novice, it's got a, a couple of songs in there where even I thought, oh, yeah, that one, I know that one. Hmm, yeah. Because, um, you know, Comfortably Numb's on there. Yeah. Another Brick in the Wall Part 2's on there. Mother's on there. Uh, Run Like Hell. There's countless songs on there. In the Flesh as well. Mm. And even, like, the shorter songs, like Bring the Boys Back Home, or, like, um, oh, what was the second song on the album? The Thin Ice or something like that? Yeah. Where more, like, inter sharp interludes. Even they, even as transitional pieces, they work. They're memorable. It does a very good job turning that album into a score. I think the bits where it has like miniature reprises of particular songs or the melody from a particular song will repeat in Michael Kay Michael Kamen, by the way, what a get for the score. You know, what, mm. what a great composer he was. Um, 
but that is really effective and i think that's a testament to pink floyd's music because you you can't just do that with any rock and roll album you can't just sort of take a motif from a song and have it work as an orchestral interlude or mm. something because the only other rock band who could probably get away with that is the who as well with their kind of rock yeah albums. yeah and that's the only example where you can technically clarify that stuff. Tommy, for example, with Ken Russell. I mean, yeah. I hope to, we can talk about Tommy again someday, but the thing is, is that even then, again, that comes from a similar, similar stand, standpoint. Again, that that record, you know, again, it's a lot less disturbed than this, but it, at the same time, it works, yeah. you know, both as a visual component and as an album and as a score, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, without spoiling what we've just been talking about, because this episode will probably go out first, but uh, there is a bit of a trend at the moment to use orchestral versions of um, of pop songs in movies, and it sometimes it works. The, the orchestral version of Toxic by Britney Spears that pops up in Promising Young Woman is the one music cue in Promising Young Woman that didn't make me want to punch the television. Um, <laughs> I did read your review on Letterboxd and I, I just went, well, that film's not going to uh, count on my rewatch list for 2021. It's no, bewilderingly bad, man. I mean, poor Carrie Mulligan, who I think is great in everything, but what, what a bizarrely written film it is. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's, that's getting us off track. Um, oh, even then, there's that segment in High Rise, isn't there, where they oh, use yeah. SOS by ABBA. Which is gorgeous. Mm. And sets up the Portish Head version coming in later. Yeah, that, that does use it very successively as a kind of motif, doesn't it? Yeah, mm. that's yeah, good. Yeah. I think there were, there were moments in this that I really took against. And I think that something like Young Lust is one of those things where I thought, yeah, it's, it's, I, you're doing sort of sexist cock rock ironically but i still hate it so you know, <laughs> it's not really escape the velocity but even that has some interesting pulls in it two of the groupies are a very young joanne wally uh mm. and little nell campbell from the rocky horror picture show which is kind of hilarious i think yeah that is quite i mean Young Lust isn't really a song that sticks out for me on that album actually the more i think about it it's it's the one where i I can remember the title, but as yeah. soon as I listen to it, it go, comes through one here and goes out the other. It, it's just like, it, and that's not me being facetious. That's just me saying, I, I can't really remember that song all that well. And that's really concerning. And, and it, it, again, it goes back to rock op operas. There are, there's always going to be like a couple of those songs in there that you aren't going to remember all that well as like, say, Comfortably Numb or going back to Tommy Pinball Wizard. Yeah, yeah. Young Lust reminds me a bit of that album Born Again that Randy Newman put out after he'd had his first big successes where the whole joke of it was that he'd like had one brief success and become this big pompous asshole rock star and it, mm. it's quite funny but at the same time you think even when you put a lot of effort into being satirically bad you have just kind of made something bad but yeah, uh, I'm glad you mentioned Mother, by the way. That was one of the songs that was a pleasant surprise to me because it has that kind mm. of old, weird Britain sense, that kind of colliery band sound that just mm -hmm. you don't really get in media anymore. It's it's too old-fashioned. But there was, I suppose that's, that's what you were talking about, the psychedelic influence along in Pink Floyd, because you can hear that kind of sound in records by the Beatles or the Small Faces oh, yeah. or the Kinks. And it, it's yeah. very off that generation, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, like, say, for example, like A Day in the Life from um, Sgt. Pepper, for yeah. example. Again, it goes back to the, like, the classical influences where that's used, like, so experimental but at the same time mm. it works you know it does work as like at the end footnote yeah and you can definitely see that in, in here with like say something like the trial where um like the classical influences again they're not really used in a pompous pretentious way it's actually used it's like very specifically and very understandably as well and i think that part of it's like due to like waters and i think the other half of it is bob Ezrin as well Bob Esper, who was 
Ezrin, who was the producer for The Wall, he's done ah. like a lot of things. Yeah, he did The Wall. He's, I, mean, I think he's worked with Alice Cooper a lot as well. That's an um, interesting jump to make. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. I do, I do like Bob Ezrin. I, I will admit, I do like him a lot. Yeah. Um, I, the other thing that's kind of interesting about this film, from my perspective, from coming to prog, like through an oppositional viewpoint, is that there is this myth that as soon as Sex Pistols released Anarchy in the UK, every single prog album just stopped selling. Um, mm. That was true for some of the worst prog bands. I think Keith Emerson <laughs> did say that, you know, he, his record sales were literally wiped out overnight by punk. But of course, yes. here, it's 1982. You know, the Sex Pistols have split up in very acrimonious circumstances. Yeah, the clash we're seeing to follow as well. Yeah. yeah, punk is very much over, but Pink Floyd is still marshalling big money to make a very lavish film. So that's kind of interesting, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting thought about that, because you would think by this point, and though there were still prog rock elements in here, because yes, around about this time would release, like, what, say, like, more pop rock ballads. Of course, this was also the time of Genesis, like, with Phil Collins as well. Yeah, that they were pivoting towards a more kind of poppy Commer radio sound as well. Yeah, yeah. commercial sound, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so... It, it's a strange era for, for prog rock because this was also the era of new wave and disco as mm. well. So it was just like, yeah, really interesting, diverse material, even though, again, I'm not a fan of the 80s, but then again, who, <laughs> we, we, we've discussed this at length, haven't we? Oh, him? boy, yeah. <laughs> I suppose that, that's a good point that I hadn't considered, though. If you were to play me sort of prog bands music from the time if you were to play me Pink Floyd and Genesis and Yes and what they were doing around this time and you said which of these bands is about to make a massive lavish musical with animated sequences and a director who does loads of commercials and music videos I would definitely pick Yes or Genesis above Pink mm. Floyd yeah 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 and somehow it was the latter option <laughs> And I think it's because, ultimately, yeah. they, they wanted to create that scary word. They wanted to make art. They wanted to make an art film that premiered at the Cannes Film Festival and freaked out Steven Spielberg and, you know, mission accomplished there, apparently. And of all, and of all the films to freak people out, The Wall? It's odd, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I suppose there is an element to it where people who were at the Cannes Film Festival are probably kind of used to seeing weird arty stuff. But this is kind of weird arty stuff on a mega budget level with all the exactly, trimmings. Yeah. And there's a part of it where sometimes it magnifies it. I watch a lot of weird films, but sometimes the most weirded out I get from a film is watching like an early-ish Tim Burton film like Beetlejuice or Batman Returns and thinking, God almighty, a studio had to sign off on this. You know, or like or like Nick Rogue yeah. delving into the witches, for example. Yes. That childhood, you know, it's just like, that's a lot more freakish in my imagination. Here, mm. it's tackling adult themes. So yeah. I expect that from the get-go, you know. Here... I get to, with the witches or say like a Tim Burton film, I immediately get disarmed. Yeah, I think that's part of it. And this does come from before the cinema de look era when French critics were trying to work out what it meant that advertising and commercial aesthetics were being used in art cinema. Um, I don't, that's kind of a weird era, that cinema de look stuff, because all of the mm. directors in it had different paths. It's like, Luc Besson was involved in, in his early days and everyone's like, oh, this is a revolution. You've got French films that look like Hollywood films. And then he went to Hollywood and made Hollywood films that look like Hollywood films. And you think, well, yeah, that's kind of less interesting. If yeah, I'm still making Hollywood films to this day. Still making Hollywood films that do indeed look like bad Hollywood films. But... <laughs> it... <laughs> Uh, what was this last one that was about a sexy supermodel who also does assassinations? Oh, wait, that's all of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Every Luke bit's on pitch. <laughs> but Cinema Deluxe also had uh, Leos Carax 
folded into it. You know, he was also part mm. of it. And he's obviously gone on to be a much more interesting director than even those very interesting early films would have had you believe. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, in terms of cinematic influences, I was sort of thinking it harks ahead to that. I also had a very specific thought, which is, has Alan Parker seen Martin Scorsese's The Big Shave? Oh, yeah, background context. The Big Shave is one of his early short films, I believe. Yeah. Where, and I remember Ryan, when we were on Eclectico, he, that was the film that freaked him out the most. And Ryan watches some nasty shit. I know, he watched some nasty, yeah, some shit, ranging from, oh, yeah, I want to watch Antichrist soon. It's just like, <laughs> really, Ryan? Really? And it's then, your funeral. <laughs> and then he goes out to say, like, the big shave is the, like, the film that freaked him out the most, because, you know, just with a guy constantly shaving himself, and I, eventually I, it, it reveals blood and things like that. It's just like, Really? I mean, I get it. I find The Big Shave yeah. very hard to watch. And I think it's it's one of those films where every time I've met someone who watches a lot of horror films, Rob is much the same as this. It's always something that is nasty, but more of art house that really gets to them. Because mm. I, I think you just, you can't nail it down. Like with, with Rob, it was um, The Cremator the Gerard Hurd oh, film, yeah. which yeah. I completely get. I think that's a chilling film. And he said, you know, I needed to take a day off watching movies just to kind of process what had happened mm. with that. Um, For me, it was like, say something like Wacom Trier's Thelma or oh, Calvary, a... for example. Yeah, yeah. Because with how the film, how the, both those films end and the twist that it takes, I felt disgusted with myself like for days afterwards, you know. For me, it's like, uh, I suppose the thing that I had the strongest reaction to takes it back to Scorsese. I am always surprised that when you get people who are not like serious film fans, but like Scorsese, um, and you do, because, you know, part of his genius is that he, he has that crossover audience, but they talk about Taxi Driver. Yep, get it. They talk mm -hmm, about Goodfellas. Yeah. Yep, get it. You know, maybe they've talked about something more recent, like The Wolf of Wall Street. Yep, get it. But it's always surprising to me that they talk about Raging Bull, because that film is incredibly bleak I think a movie about a breakdown made by people who were having a breakdown and I just found it so oppressive when I watched it mm. even the dogs are bothered by the, the <laughs> thought of it oh let me tell them off again <laughs> <laughs> like I said I'll get I'll, I'll let them run around boys stop it they do this shit all the time <laughs> um, keep that bit in actually I think I will yeah um, but we were talking about the, the big shave yeah and whatever influence Parker uh, was was taking for that scene I read it was also for Waters it was based on something that actually happened with Sid Barrett who I guess is kind of the ghost at the feast here right hmm uh... Talk about talking about Sid Barrett. I mean, that's probably the only era of Pink Floyd that I've been inclined to listen to, but never got round to. Yeah. Um, and you know, you could definitely tell that influence on, say, something like Wish You Were Here, because when you talk about Sid Barrett in a traditional sense, you know how uh how much a frightening story that man led mm. as well. So it's it's only a matter of time where you just think to yourself, I'm, I'm curious now. I mean. I know he's built like a legacy behind him, even though he only did like one studio album with Pink Floyd before vanishing entirely. Yeah. And for all that Pink is obviously an autobiographical character for Waters, I think it would have been hard for him to create a character of a rock star having a breakdown without thinking at least a little bit about Sid Barris. Because there's that story of when he turned up in the recording studio for Wish You Were Here. And he looked terrible. I mean, mm. no hair, put on a lot of weight, just looked like a ghost of a former man, where even people like Roger Waters and David Gilmore just looked at him and were just like, who would nerfs that? Yeah. And it's just like, it's hard not to think that when you're watching this. Yeah. And it's one of those things, isn't it, where people are very good at 
talking about death in popular music and death in many ways is something that mythologizes people but uh, as we've discussed with Amy before but um, people are very bad about talking about mental health and I think the fact that Sid Barrett you know didn't die at 27 in a blaze of glory he just had this slow decline is mm. one of the things that makes that story feel so unsettling and unresolved yeah 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 yeah, I think that's that, that's kind of covered my feelings about the wall. Uh, I don't think I could ever love it, but I found it easier to get on with than I expected. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it, it, I, I'm going to say this right now. I don't think it's my favourite Parker film that I've seen so far. For me, it's either between like Angel Heart or Birdie. I must but... watch Angel Heart. I feel like that would turn me around a bit on him. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, even if, like, <laughs> how unsubtle that film can be. Robert De Niro playing Luce Cifer. <laughs> yes, I I had heard the twist, and somehow I don't feel like... I, I, I wasn't thinking, oh, man, that spoiled it for me. I would never be able to guess that otherwise. I know, yeah. It's just... Mm, completely agree. The, the other uh, piece of trivia I, I thought could possibly be a thing we could close on is that the crossed hammers symbol that is the symbol of the the fascist the pink floyd the pink turns into uh, was adopted by an organization called the Hammerskins, who were dedicated to producing actual neo-nazi music uh, and i mention that because it proves that at least one person out there missed the message of this film harder than doug walker did <laughs> Oh, and are we that, going there? <laughs> that, listeners, is a cliffhanger. We're doing a cliffhanger. If you've listened to our Patreon exclusive episode, which comes out the very day after this, you will find out how we dared to review Pink Floyd's The Wall when the definitive review of it already exists. <laughs> Even the dogs are ecstatic about this <laughs> They I'm, letting them, themselves. I'm, I'm letting them run rampant in the next episode. Fuck <laughs> it, I don't care. Well, so yeah, if, if you want to listen to us tackle nostalgia critics, The Wall, you can donate to our Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash The Geek Show, where you also get our other movie podcast directors, Lottery, My Doctor Who Reviews, and any fun bits that we just can't fit in anywhere else. But until tomorrow... Till tomorrow. That's been a lot from Pop Screen. I've been Graham. And I've been Erden. And that is Dexter. No, not Dexter. Orvis and Bailey barking in the background. <laughs> they can't wait.